Well, in the meantime, you may have heard that there was another one of those debates last night. And not being a masochist, again, I didn't watch the debate, but late in the evening, around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, I was surfing around, and on MSNBC, CNN, and Fox, they were having the afterward uh, reviews of what went on with the panel of experts. And it's interesting that Pat Buchanan, who so criticized the Republican Party four years ago, is acting as a cheerleader for George Bush this year. He was on one of the panels, I believe it was on MSNBC. And then I happened to see about the first 20 minutes of the debate, along with, on one of the shows, a uh, finish of the debate, the very end of the debate. And in both the beginning and the end, it was very interesting that although during the debate, the two candidates were very hostile to each other and said things that really could be considered mean in some senses. But at the beginning of the debate and at the end of the debate, they shook hands, smiled at each other, whispered in each other's ear, laughed at some private jokes. In other words, they were all lovey-dovey. And it's all just a game to them, I guess. They don't really care about what it is they said. All they care about is being elected. And that, of course, really typifies the entire campaign. They will say anything to get elected. There were a number of things that I saw in just the brief clips that were on these review shows. Kerry said that 1.6 million jobs had been lost during the four years that George Bush was president. But as factcheck.org, a site that's devoted to correcting the errors of the presidential candidates, as factcheck.org pointed out, Kerry was making a misleading remark in saying that 1.6 million jobs had been lost because those were private sector jobs. And you should be counting the 800,000 new government jobs that have been created in the last four years, which means only 800,000 net jobs have been lost. Imagine that during the last four years of this pro-free enterprise, limited government uh, administration, 800,000 new jobs have been created in government. Not all in the federal government, of course, some of them at state and local governments. And, of course, John Kerry getting at George Bush over the Dulfer, Dulfer report, which came out this week. As you know, it said that there were no weapons of mass destruction. There were no, uh, there was no ability to build weapons of mass destruction in the near future. In, in other words, it completely repudiated George Bush, even though Bush had been saying all year long, I'm waiting for the Dufer report. But what's been happening since that report came out is that all the liberals have been saying that the sanctions worked, that George Bush was wrong to give up on the sanctions and the, and the inspections and go to war, that the sanctions were working. And the New York Times had an editorial in which it said, the report shows that the international sanctions that Mr. Bush dismissed and demeaned before the war and still does were astonishingly effective. And John Kerry repeated that last night, saying the sanctions were working, the sanctions were effective. Well, they certainly were effective. 500,000 men, women, and children of Iraq died, apparently, because of those sanctions, died from malnutrition, died from lack of medicines, because the United States and Great Britain were blocking these things from getting into Iraq. Now, the people that died didn't include Saddam Hussein or members of the Republican Guard or that dreaded Fayyadeen that we heard so much about at the beginning of the war. These were just plain old civilian men, women, and children who had never been a threat to the United States. But they died because of these sanctions, and now the liberals are holding up those sanctions as being very effective, that they were working, that they should have stayed in place. And I just have to say that those who believe that government is there to do one's bidding just can't imagine any solution to any problem that doesn't involve using the force of government, even if it means killing a lot of people. Don't ever let people work things out by persuasion or voluntary agreement. And by any standard of nonviolence, even George Bush's brutalizing of Iraq has not been nearly so cruel as the 12 years of sanctions that deprived Iraqis of the food and medicines that they needed to survive. If you ever wanted a demonstration of how corrupt, of how cruel, of how oblivious to human life are the two major parties and their candidates and all their leading spokesmen in Congress or out of Congress, you have to look no further than this whole Iraq business. It is a case of A or B, a, kill tens of thousands of Iraqis. B, kill hundreds of thousands of Iraqis. There is no C, kill no Iraqis at all. Well, during the debate, George Bush said that Hussein could have ended the sanctions by just coming clean. Has he forgotten that in December 2002, Hussein submitted a 1,000-page report on what had happened to all the weapons of mass destruction? And it said that we don't have any anymore. We destroyed them all. Here's where we destroyed these. Here's where we destroyed those. And the Bush administration, of course, edited out the part that said where they got these WMDs from the United States during the 1980s and then passed it around the world. 
But what was Hussein supposed to do? Create a bunch of weapons of mass destruction, show them to Bush, and then destroy them publicly? We were talking about the debates last night. Afterward, Sean Hannity, that purveyor of all things unbiased and impartial, said that George Bush won the election last night. He so demolished John Kerry in that debate that the election is as good as over. Now, it's actually possible that despite all the cheerleading that all these spin doctors do, that Hannity actually believes that, because it brings out an important point about debates, and that is everybody wins in a debate. You always think your side won because your guy was the only guy who brought up the important points. The other guy keeps talking about irrelevancies, but your guy is the only one that really focuses on the real issues, so you think your side won, and I think maybe Hannity thought he won. One of the really interesting things in the debate was when John Kerry said that every American should get the same good health care that members of Congress get. How good is that? asked the voice from the rear. Well, let me tell you. In 1994, an 84-year-old congressman named William Natcher of Kentucky, a Democrat, had been in Bethesda Naval Hospital for several weeks, uh, apparently suffering from exhaustion. He had set a congressional record by not missing a single congressional vote in over 18,000 votes. Actually, 18,401 votes in a row he had been present to cast his vote. And so while he was in the hospital, he left the hospital frequently to go to the House floor and keep his record intact. Well, on Wednesday, March 2nd, 1994, it was a little harder than usual to get out of bed and toddle over to the Capitol building. But he had some help. He was wheeled into the House chamber on a hospital gurney with oxygen and intravenous, <laughs> intravenous feeding tubes attached to his nose. Now, he was accompanied by four hospital attendants. Now, just imagine, if John Kerry is elected, you're going to get the same good health care that all congressmen get. That means that if you aren't feeling very well, you'll have four hospital attendants to wheel you to the office. Isn't that great? Oh, my God. <laughs> well, is this really the kind of health care <laughs> is this really the kind of health care we can all expect? Uh, well, maybe not. After all, your, your job isn't as important as that of Representative Hatcher and all the other guys. Hatcher had pork to barrel. He had logs to roll and scratches to back. You, on the other hand, do nothing more serious than provide a valuable service to your customers or your employer. Of course, the real question isn't whether we'll get health care as good as the royalty get. We know that's not true. We know we won't. But a more serious question would be whether the President and Congress will be forced to get their medical care from the same health care Soviets that they want to herd us into with whatever brand of socialized medicine they're going to foist upon us. In other words, will these aristocrats of Washington, uh, are they going to be burdened by the same price controls, the same rationing, the same lack of second opinions, the same standardized insurance package that they want to force on us? Well, I guess we know the answer to that one, too. The whole issue wouldn't be so serious if it weren't obvious that some kind of socialized medicine is on the way. And the coming health care system, no matter which party designs it and whatever form it takes, we know is going to cause a lot of people to die prematurely from lack of proper care, just as it has in Canada, just as it has in Britain, just as it has in Scandinavia, France, Germany, Italy, Belgium, and all the advanced countries of the world that have a health care system that America lacks. In all those places, people are dying. Even here in America, with the best health care system in the world, despite the government handicaps thrown in the way, people still die here. And with socialized medicine, it can only get worse. So, when I am king, I won't worry so much about who has health insurance. Instead, I will simply impose a law doing away with death itself. However, as with all other laws, Congress will be exempt. Well, you know, a few weeks ago, it came up on the show that I happened to mention that when I was in the Army, they told us that you could not criticize the government, you could not criticize the Army, you could not write letters to the editor disputing American policy. And at the time I was in the Army, at least when I went in, the Korean War was on. And they made it very, very clear that you had no free speech as long as you were in the Army. But then you, after all, you volunteered to get in there. Well, no, wait a minute. You didn't volunteer. At least I didn't. I was drafted. A form of slavery, I believe. Well, it turns out that the Army is getting ready to prosecute a, a soldier who wrote an article that appeared on LouRockwell.com. And in that article, he criticized what was going on in Iraq and said that the whole thing was based on such unrealistic ideas about what was necessary to win that there was no chance whatsoever that it would succeed. 
He said in the article, quote, I have come to the conclusion that we cannot win here for a number of reasons. Ideology and idealism will never trump history and reality. End of quote. The four key reasons he gave for the likely failure were a refusal to deal with reality, not understanding what motivates the enemy, an overabundance of guerrilla fighters, and the enemy's shorter lines of supplies and communication. Which, that last point about the shorter lines of supply, was one that Richard Mayberry points out doomed Hitler when he invaded Germany. Richard Mayberry pointed that out in his book on the Second World War. So anyway, this army sergeant now faces charges that could give him 20 years in prison. And it would be the first such case since the Vietnam War. And he's also under possible indictment under civilian law. And so this is what happens when people in the Army criticize the government. And now it is my pleasure to present Mr. Michael Badnarik, who is the Libertarian Party's presidential candidate this year. Michael Badnarik was a uh, nuclear engineer who uh, has been, for the past few years, conducting courses on constitutional law and the nature of the Constitution and won the nomination at the Libertarian Party's convention, Memorial Day weekend, at the end of May, and has been campaigning ever since. And if he sounds a little tired, <laughs> don't hold it against him. Campaigning is not the easiest thing in the world to do. Good evening, Michael. Good evening. Thanks so much for having me on. It's a pleasure. Where are you tonight? Uh, we are just leaving uh, Carbondale, Illinois. Um, we just finished a fundraiser just uh, less than half an hour ago, and I'm on my way back to St. Louis where we have a hotel room, and early tomorrow morning we'll be uh, flying out to Minnesota to light the fires of liberty. Well, I told the audience at the beginning of the show as a teaser that you had been arrested last night, so I take it you're not out on bail and you don't have to go back to the prison. No, I don't have to go back to prison. It was uh, a fairly nonviolent uh, event. What we were trying to do is to uh, serve papers on the uh, uh, committee for the uh, presidential debate. The Libertarian Party of Arizona has filed a lawsuit with regard to the third debate in Tempe, Arizona, and uh, I had copies of those papers and was trying to present them uh, in St. Louis. Naturally, the uh, powers that be, specifically the uh, police forces surrounding the debate, uh, were not allowing me to cross over. Um, originally, this was supposed to be a very scripted event where you know the police uh, you know shook their finger at me and told me not to cross the line. Uh, David Cobb, the uh, Green Party presidential candidate, and I were both going to cross that line, and uh, and then we were going to allow ourselves to be handcuffed. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the way it actually played out. We were uh, actually uh, presented with the phalanx of uh, riot gear. And uh, it was a very sensitive situation trying to, you know, cross over the line without actually uh, presenting a, a threat or anything that might resemble a threat. And at one point, a huge officer in the second row just beckoned to me with his finger. They opened the uh, shields and allowed me to walk through peacefully, and then I was handcuffed on the other side. Well, and then what happened when you got to the jail? Uh, we were uh, processed and fingerprinted. We were uh, uh, booked uh, with refusing to heed a uh, rational uh, reasonable uh, police officer. And so, uh, was he uh, rational and reasonable? Uh, no, the person that I was looking at was not being particularly rational or reasonable. Um, the huge batons, and uh, we were looking at anything but reasonable. And we were looking so, at force. They, they were definitely looking at force. And anybody who has a doubt that the United States is becoming a police state uh, only need to stand and look into their eyes as they... Uh, uh, they glared back through their shields. Uh, fortunately, once I got through that uh, that barricade, the officers on the inside were were very pleasant, very respectful, and they understood that this was simply a political gesture, and uh, and that they were very uh, very casual and matter of fact. Uh, although I pointed out that uh, you know as they were handcuffing us and putting us into the van, I, I asked them whether they realized or were aware of the fact they had two presidential candidates in their custody, and whether that made any logical sense to them at all. Uh, but uh, they what, took it, down. what did they say? Uh, well, they didn't say anything. I mean, it's, it's one of those questions where, you know, they, they simply say, look, you know, we're only trying to do our jobs as we understand it. And, you know, they really don't want to be confronted with uh, sure. you know, the idea of freedom of speech. So they took us to the uh, police station. We were booked and fingerprinted. And it was a very mundane process, very boring, actually, uh, because, you know, once the drama of crossing the line is over, uh, then they just keep you sitting there in the van waiting impatiently before the, uh, they progress. And they were just getting ready to take us to the uh, station. I think, when five college students, uh, apparently unaware of the fact that the uh, debates were being held so close, were walking home during their, uh, their normal shortcut across a uh, meadow when they were confronted and accosted by the police. And so we, uh, we had another uh, hour and a half at the scene waiting for them to uh, process uh, three, three young men and two young women who were subsequently thrilled to learn that they were being arrested with two presidential candidates. So at 12.01 this morning when we were all being released, uh, David Cobb and I spent uh, quite a bit of time signing autographs as proof that they had been arrested with uh, two celebrities. 
Did uh, any of the police officers ask for your autographs? Um, only, only the ones where uh, we were you know, acknowledging the uh, charges against us. Oh. Uh, there, there, there were, you, you, know, were, you were autographing forms. I was autographing forms, right. Oh, I see. All right. Well, do you think all this was worth the trouble? Um, I certainly hope so. The idea was to an attempt to draw media attention, and we had, um, well, at least by my count, it was very dark. Uh, I, I thought that there were like five, maybe even six uh, television cameras there. Uh, that, that might be an exaggeration because I was focusing on the... Uh, you know, the batons and the shields. Right, but, you're talking uh, about outside at the uh, demonstration. I, outside at the demonstration, David Cobb and I made a short statement before we uh, we crossed the line, and I do know for a fact that the local St. Louis media did cover it uh, during the nightly news later that evening, but except for uh, several thousand hits on our blog, uh, people were, were responding. I just finished an interview on a Texas radio station that was asking me about the event. Um, I, I don't believe that we got any national coverage out of the deal, which is really what we were hoping for. Well, the blog on your website uh, does link to a number of uh, uh, newspaper stories about it, so you did get some press coverage. Oh, excellent. Uh, you haven't seen that, I guess. You've been a little busy the last 24 I hours. have been a little bit busy. Um, I got out of jail at uh, midnight. At the time I got a, a sandwich and got to bed, it was 2 a.m., and we woke up at 5.30 this morning to uh, get to the airport, and we flew from St. Louis to Kansas City for uh, an event, and we took the shortcut through Chicago. Uh, Michael, what would you say uh, have been the things that you're happiest about so far in the campaign that you've been able to achieve. It's only been June, July, August, September, I guess four months. What do you think? Well, the thing that I am the happiest about is that libertarians seem to be excited and enthusiastic uh, about the party and about promoting the message, and I am flattered that libertarians appear to be pulling together uh, on my campaign. Um, I was not the most popular candidate in um, Atlanta, but I think that I was everyone's second choice. And when I, I came from behind to win the nomination, I'm, I'm again flattered that uh, Gary Nolan and Aaron Russo have both uh, worked hard on my campaign. Gary Nolan is uh, continuing through uh, direct uh, media contacts to us. Uh, Aaron Russo has produced three 30-second television commercials for the campaign, and all of their supporters have been very uh, helpful. Uh, we've got volunteers in all 50 states, and and I think that we have given the, uh, the Libertarian members kind of a, a sense of camaraderie and a goal that we can all work for together. Because, you know, as Libertarians, we agree on 90% of the, uh, 98% of the issues. And, you know, there are still 2% that Libertarians who are intelligent and opinionated still disagree on. But uh, I think that the success that we've been seeing so far this year has been due to the fact that, uh, you know, all the Libertarian factions in all the different states are all coming up with new ideas and ways to uh, promote the party, to promote uh, my campaign, and to... Uh, raise awareness of the party so that the candidates at the local and state levels um, have a greater chance of winning their elections. Well, of course, it's very, very important to promote the libertarian label, because if you don't do that, then, of course, the local candidates don't get any help out of the presidential campaign at all. And, and Absolutely. So long, for such a long time, there have been people in the party that have said, we shouldn't waste money on the presidential campaign, the money would be better spent on this, that, or something else. Uh, they don't realize that the presidential campaign is the only chance we have to get on a platform and get national TV coverage. It's not coverage like Bush and Kerry get, but it's a heck of a lot more than any libertarian gets under any other circumstances. And if that opportunity is squandered by not mentioning the word libertarian frequently, then, of course, those local candidates don't get any help from it. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm happy to report that we've been getting really excellent media coverage this year. Um, I've been doing anywhere between 6 to 12 interviews a day, and the good news is they are treating me as a legitimate candidate from a legitimate party. Uh, they are asking me uh, good questions. They seem to be uh, interested, sincerely interested in my answers. And we have actually turned the tables in some cases. As you know, most political reports talk about the Republicans did this, the Democrats did that. And if we're lucky, in the last paragraph they say, and the Libertarians were there. Well, I gave a speech at a small government rally in Tennessee, and the newspaper article the following day was a three-quarter page article. It quoted me accurately. And in the last paragraph it said, and the Democrats and Republicans were there. And so I was tickled that at least in one small Tennessee town, we have turned the tables and made the Democrats and Republicans the other party. No, well, that's good. Uh, there again, a lot of libertarians don't realize that the presidential campaign has that opportunity in that people in the media do tend to treat our presidential candidates with respect. They may at other times uh, just write us off as being unimportant, but they will treat you with respect. Now, that doesn't apply to all people. I certainly know that when I was running, there were a small handful that when I was on their shows, they tended to scoff at me. Michael Medved comes to mind. Oh, I yes. Did you I, do his show? I did his show, and uh, I confess that I was a little bit nervous before doing it because I knew they would be hostile. But by the end of the program, uh, Michael had been... It had come completely unglued. It was yelling and screaming at me, using all sorts of ad hominem attacks. 
and uh, I was told that it was a wonderful interview because it just demonstrated that uh, you know he has the ability to lose his professionalism. <laughs> what are your plans for the uh, remaining three weeks or so of the campaign? Uh, what, what's on the horizon? We are going to be traveling constantly. Um, we are going. To, I guess the primary thing is going to be a an alternate party debate in Tennessee, which I believe will be against uh, David Cobb of the Green Party and Michael Perutka of the uh, Constitution Party. We have consistently invited uh, Ralph Nader to these debates, but he has uh, continued to decline. We also, just for the record, always invite George Bush and John Kerry, and we send those invitations through uh, certified mail so we get documentation that they received the uh, invitation. And uh, I bet they don't even RSVP. Can no, you imagine? no, they just don't have the common courtesy to let us know that uh, they are busy that day. Michael, we're going to take some phone calls now and in the next half hour. Let's talk first with David in North Carolina. Good evening, Dave. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Thank you for calling. Uh, do you have a question for Michael Bednarik? Yes, indeed I do. It was uh, very interesting to hear about the events of last night at the so-called day. certainly would have been wonderful to hear his viewpoints and uh, listen to the, uh, the response of the uh, candidates of the duopoly to them. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question relative to the third debate. Are you going to push it further, Michael? You've got people here who are willing to put on their motorcycle gear and wade into the melee with you. Well, um, the libertarians in Arizona are uh, staunch libertarians, and they have asked me to uh, participate in civil disobedience uh, the last time I was in town. Um, I don't know precisely uh, what that civil disobedience is likely to be. Um, as a libertarian, I would never initiate force, and, and I would certainly never do anything that was likely to bring embarrassment on the libertarian party. Um, but definitely the... Uh, the people in Arizona have got things pretty well organized, and when we get there, we will probably, you know, do another police crossing or something like that. But uh, again, we're not we're not trying to incite a riot. What we're trying to do is uh, draw media attention to the, uh, you know, the disparity between the Democrats and Republicans and other third parties. Absolutely. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be working on the national television level. We need to do something with better TV. I don't know what that would be. Well, be surrounding you with twenty guys in full it, motorcycling leathers and full base helmets. If I may, David, since uh, we're just about to go to a break, let me uh, interject here, Michael. That there's a misconception that if you just do the right thing, you will be covered. In other words, if you flip uh, pancakes in Des Moines, Iowa, at a coffee shop, you'll get on television the way George Bush and John Kerry do. No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't matter too much what you do because you're not George Bush or John Kerry. And the first test of the media is: Do you have any uh, chance of affecting the outcome of this election? And that's what we as libertarians have to demonstrate to other people. Until we do, we are not the kind of news, no matter what we do, even if we run naked through Central Park. And we're going to start with Marsha in Ohio. Good evening, Marsha. What's your question for Mr. Badner? Okay, hi, Michael. I'd like to ask you how much of any importance you place on the fact that both, both Bush and Harry on Nationwide TV kind of answered the same question about skull and bones um, membership. And they both, Bush, for example, he laughed and said it's so sick we can't talk about it. And I believe Harry said the same thing somewhat. Can you kind of tell us how you feel about that? Uh, well, I don't know that much about the uh, Skull and Bones. In fact, for a long time, I thought that it was uh, just kind of a, uh, an urban legend, you know. But uh, when I was at Yale, I actually took a photograph out in front of that building. Um, I don't think that it's uh, appropriate for our leaders to be involved in a uh, secret society, which, uh, you know, apparently, you know, denies them the opportunity to tell us uh, how they would operate in certain situations. Uh, I think well, they they, do they still belong to it now? I, oh, yeah. I, well, I don't, I don't know that you're ever not in that club. I think it's like, uh, you know, some of these other organizations. Once you're in, it's like the mafia. Once you're in, you're in for life. Uh, you know, their oath, of office, their oath to the skull and bones actually precedes all of their oaths, even the oath of office presidency. And that's what uh, I'd like to see them ask, if they would denounce that oath they took, because that's the biggie to all of us that know about it. Well, yeah. I'm sure they'd say they would. Yeah, well, well, I don't know if they'd be allowed to, but it's a serious thing because a lot of research by many people have went into this, and it's well, true, it's fact, and people need to know what's going on. Well, I've never taken that oath to the skull and bones, and my only oath would be, you know, to protect and defend the Constitution and the rights of Americans. Right. All right. Well, we're, we're pushing for you, Michael. We're, a lot of people are behind you. have no idea what's going on because well, you, I appreciate people that. are behind you big time. Thank you. Thanks for the call, Marsha. Let's go to Texas now and talk with Terry. Good evening, Terry. Well, hello. And, uh, Michael, it's only three more weeks, and you'll be able to get a decent night's sleep. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, I plan to sleep until noon, at least, on November 3rd. Uh, you mean three days and then wake up noon on the 3rd? <laughs> um now, when you started uh, when you started this a, a year ago, uh, or about a year ago, did it ever dawn on you that you would end up on the very same day as Martha Stewart being in, and, and the Green Party candidate uh, being incarcerated as political prisoners uh, for just exercising your just right? No, I, um, a lot of what has happened along the campaign trail has been a bit of a surprise. Um, I'm simply doing the best job that I can. I'm honored and flattered that the uh, delegates in Atlanta selected me to be their standard bearer this year. Um, and, and I think this is purely coincidental that... Uh, uh, David Cobb and I got arrested the same day that uh, 
Martha Stewart went in. I thought you were going to say you were honored and flattered to be, have been arrested on the same day that Martha Stewart was. Oh, yeah. Well, that would have made sense. <laughs> Uh, I've got one more question about the uh, Constitution Party uh, uh, opponent that, uh, that you're up against on the next debate uh, for uh, uh, president. Um, how do you think uh, his argument works uh, in terms of putting God, the Holy Bible, and all of that first, or the Constitution, if he's the candidate of the Constitution Party? Uh, that's, that's the stuff we saw on the uh, PBS uh, coverage of, uh, of the uh, debate uh, between you guys and, and also the crashing the parties uh, thing. And I'll, I'll get off the line and uh, let you kind of play with that one. Okay, thanks for your call, Terry. Um, well, I've uh, spoken with Mr. Perutka, and I, I think that he's a fairly pleasant individual. However, it's interesting that they would label their party the Constitution Party when all of their uh, uh, positions are centered on the Bible. And it is my interpretation that uh, Mr. Perutka supports freedom of religion, but only when it's his religion. A libertarian party, on the other hand, has many Christians, many Muslims, many Jews, many atheists, and we believe in freedom of all religions. And that's why we, our focus is on the Constitution and liberty, and not what the, which religion should be uh, promoted within the United States. Yes, the party really should be called the Bible Party, because they do put that right at the beginning of their platform, that this is uh, the origin of all of their stands. And it's also interesting, when I debated Howard Phillips in 2000, that one of the, his big applause lines before a conservative audience that, that was attending the debate was that on his first day in office, he'd get all the U.S. attorneys to go out and close all the abortion clinics around the country. And apparently he never read the Constitution, because he would have found out, had he done so, that the Constitution gives the federal government no authority to enforce any kind of laws against common crime crimes, like murder, rape, whatever. So even if you think abortion is murder, it's still not the business of the federal government. So the Constitution is not foremost in the Constitution Party, even though a lot of their positions parallel the positions of the Libertarian Party. So, so much so much for that. Now let's talk instead with J.P. in Florida. Good evening, J.P. you with us? Yes, I'm with you, uh, and it's a pleasure to talk to both you, Mr. Brown and Mr. Benarick. Uh, Mr. Benarick, you have a vote for me, uh, guaranteed on November 2nd. Thank you. Um, I just have a quick comment and a quick question. Um, my comment is... Uh, by looking over the text of the uh, debate, uh, the first debate did not, neither, neither gentleman uh, said the word Constitution one time during the entire debate. Um, and uh, in the second debate, uh, when President Bush was asked if he could, uh, if he had a vacancy in the Supreme Court, who we choose, he said he would pick somebody uh, that wouldn't allow their personal opinion given the way. He said, I would pick somebody who would strictly interpret the Constitution of the United States, which <laughs> I'm sure both of you find laughable. Sure. I just wanted to get a comment from, from both of you on, on, on that fact. Uh, nobody mentioned the Constitution, and the president said that in the second one. Yeah, Michael, any comments? Well, I, I think that it's uh, significant that they have been spending most of the campaign talking about their relative uh, merits uh, in the military or not, and uh, I think they're using that as a smokescreen to avoid important issues, even during the campaign, or excuse me, during the debates. Uh, they seem to really kind of focus on just one or two minor topics and the differences uh, between them uh, rather than things that American people are really interested in. Um, please note that when uh, David Cobb and I debate, we take uh, questions from the audience, uh, which means that our debates are totally unscripted and we are able to uh, give answers uh, to average Americans. Yes, they're unscreened questions, and the questions that were asked in the debate last night had all been screened by the moderator, and the questioners were required to read their questions as standing there in the audience and read their questions exactly as they had been submitted so that no one could pull a switch at the last minute and ask an important question. All right, you had a second question for Michael? Yeah, and I appreciate you uh, being patient with me. Now, the second question was, uh, here in Florida, uh, it's the land of the easily uh, amended uh, amend amendments. So it's easy to introduce an amendment here to the Florida Constitution. By and voter I, initiative. Right, by yeah. voter initiative. So anybody who has uh, hires enough part-time workers to stand outside of a supermarket and get enough signatures in order to get a petition started to amend the Constitution of Florida. Uh, you know, there's bullet trains and a lot of boondoggles. I mean, last election season there was even an amendment for pregnant pigs not to be put in cages. It's, it's pretty ridiculous. Um, and along with an amendment to raise the, uh, the, the minimum wage, there's an amendment now, which kind of, kind of confuses me, and I wanted to get your opinion, uh, your opinion on this. There's an amendment that's, uh, that's, put in, that's put into the voter initiative right now that uh, will, uh, if passed, uh, limit the amount of, uh, of, of lawyer fees to $150,000 of medical malpractice suits. So if somebody wins a medical malpractice suit, the most a lawyer can uh, get is $150,000. Uh, I was wondering what, uh, what uh, either of you gentlemen, what your take was on, on that particular issue. Michael? Um, that's an interesting thing. I, I, first of all, I want to say that I think that we do need to uh, revise our judicial system. Um, I think that they, the judges um, and lawyers have taken way too much power, and I think that the judges tend to legislate from the bench, uh, you know, almost creating new laws by misinterpreting the old ones. Um, so I understand the motivation behind uh, limiting the fees that lawyers get, but uh, as a, a strict libertarian, I think that it should be, you know, kind of a, a free market. Um, I, I think that people need to take a little bit more responsibility for themselves and uh, and to avoid contracting I mean, with uh, lawyers who are going to charge that much. 
money. Um, I've never required uh, having a lawyer yet myself, so I'm not sure exactly how these lawyers come up with the fees that they do. But uh, I think that most of us tend to feel helpless uh, with the judicial system. And if a lawyer is promising to take, uh, you know, contingency fees, if they're willing to do the case, if uh, we are willing to give them 60, 70, 80 percent of the, uh, the returns, uh, I think that's un unfortunate. But I think that we bring that upon ourselves for being willing to agree to such contracts. Well, it's also true that many of these class action lawsuits and the other big payoff lawsuits that are supposedly the target of litigation reform, uh, these big suits are based on laws that have been passed by Congress or state legislatures. And without those laws, these suits would not be possible. So I've always contended that the problem is not too many lawyers, it's too many laws. And I don't think the libertarian presidential candidate would disagree with me that there are too many laws. And it's interesting that the Republican solution to this is, well, let's pass another law. And yes. this law will, will tell people what they can do in court and so forth and so on. And, of course, the Democrats like it the way it is. The Republicans think we need one more law. Pardon me for inter interjecting. JP, did you get an answer to your question? Yes, I did. And, you know, once again, George Bush wants to get the uh, Supreme Court justice to strictly interpret the Constitution. <laughs> right. Uh, and I'm sure the check will be in the mail. And you'll, <laughs> and you'll respect us in the morning. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, like I said, Mr. Van Eric, you, you sure got my vote on November 2nd. Thank you so much. Good. Well, now, what is that, five or six? How many? <laughs> Uh, I don't know about you, Michael, but I've already met everybody that voted for me. In oh, really? Yes. <laughs> well, uh, Mom and Dad uh, live in northern Indiana, and they have a large contingent. They were putting out guard signs, and I was hoping that Lake County, Indiana, actually had an electoral vote because I think I might actually win that one. <laughs> Good. Uh, I don't know what your schedule is, but if you could stay on for an extra and a half hour, we have... Uh, people on the line and plenty of email questions. Uh, I'll, I'll have to be happy to stay with you. Okay, good. Well, let us go now to Tennessee and talk to Bob, and then at the bottom of the hour after that break, we'll take some of these email questions that have come in. Bob, are you with us this evening? Yes, I am. Good. Good. What's on your mind? Uh, I had a comment and a, and a question, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go home and let uh, your guest answer. What would you do about a trade that uh, people in this country don't have a level playing field? Uh, I work all over this country uh, in my line of work, and I see uh, so many of our manufacturing jobs leaving this country. Uh, what, what worries me is, in this day and time, if, if we were to go back to a time like, uh, say, for instance, when we entered World War One or World War Two, we were a strong nation. We uh, had a strong manufacturing base, and we were able to turn those factories around and build the stuff we needed to uh, defend our country. Uh, the more and more of our manufacturing jobs leave in this country, and a lot in my area, not just my area, but other areas that I work in. Okay, would, Bob. Would have that today. Yeah, Michael, what's your feeling about this? Well, the NAFTA and GATT treaties, which are both labeled free trade agreements, uh, are nothing of the sort. NAFTA all by itself is 22,000 pages of regulations that are a, that create a hostile economic environment in the United States, raising the cost of doing business so high that it cuts into the company's profit margin. Those companies are then motivated to move their manufacturing jobs offshore to other countries where the regulations are less stringent. And so the first step would be to eliminate NAFTA and GATT uh, to allow companies to stay in the United States. The second step would be to dramatically reduce the size of the federal government, leaving billions of dollars in the hands of ordinary Americans who would then spend that money. We would then have small businesses springing up to provide new goods and services, and not only would we raise our standard of living, but our economy would grow exponentially. Um, very good. Bob, does that handle it for you? That's a very good answer. I, I'm, I'm, glad to, I'm glad to have a, uh, an answer that makes some sense for today. And we have gotten four emails asking if you have tried to get on The Daily Show with John Stewart. And also one questioner asked about The Bill Maher Show. Two questioners asked about The Bill Maher Show and one about Dennis Miller and one about Howard Stern. But all four asked about The Daily Show with John Stewart. First of all, are, have you seen The Daily Show, Michael? Do you know what it is? I, I have seen it. Uh, I think it's very funny. In fact, uh, I, wanna, I just read a book that uh, John Stewart wrote called America, the book. And it is hysterical. I, uh, I highly recommend it. Um, we have been desperately trying to get on Daily Show, Bill Maher Show, and, uh, and others like that. Um, we have a, uh, a publicity group that is uh, trying to get those leads for us. And uh, I would love to, uh, to, to be on those programs. In fact, I would also like to be on uh, David Letterman's show. Uh, I was born in Indiana. David is uh, from Indiana. He frequently has his mother on. And my mother is now running for lieutenant governor in Indiana. And so uh, he would be a... I think it would be an interesting thing to have David and his mother, along with my mother and I, uh, for the evening. Sure. But, but I, unfortunately, that right now is just kind of a, uh, a wish that I have. I don't think we've come very close to achieving that at all. Now, David Letterman is going to be a tough nut to crack, but I would think that John Stewart would be glad to have you on, uh, given all that I know about it. And I tape the show every night and watch it when I quit work. Uh, I had never heard of it in 2000, so I don't know if anybody made an attempt to get me on that show. But ever since I first saw it, maybe a year and a half ago, I have just thought it's a great show. And it skewers both 
the Democrats and the Republicans make fun of both George Bush and John Kerry, and yet at the same time he's very respectful to any guest that comes on the show, whether that guest is a Republican, a Democrat, a news person, or whatever it may be. So I would think that he would enjoy having you on and getting another dimension, and if so, he would treat you very well. So good luck with that. I hope it works out. Thank you. Uh, Michael in San Francisco says, The feedback I get about Michael... You, Michael Bednarik, not Michael in San Francisco. The feedback I get about Michael Bednarik is he's an excellent speaker, but would do better to highlight the joy of liberty and the harm of government rather than using precious speaking time to dwell on what's constitutional. Average voters care significantly more about losing their freedom than losing an abstract idea to them, like the Constitution. I strongly encourage him to focus on the exciting essence of libertarianism in his speeches and interviews. I guess he probably has gotten this advice before. What are his comments? Michael? Um, well, I, I try to uh, point out that I'm running for president, uh, not because I'm looking for the glory, but because I don't think that uh, on our current trend, we're going to have very much of America to, uh, to save. Uh, during my campaign, um, I spoke at a number of colleges where I was obligated to speak in a huge auditorium, even though there were a small number of students, and the rationale was that as a presidential candidate, I was obligated to speak in the free speech zone. There was also a free speech zone in Boston during the Democratic National Convention, which consisted of chain link fence and razor wire. Yes. Uh, and so um, I think that we need to teach people about the Constitution and uh, do something to dramatically limit the power of government. Well, do you, before you get into what is constitutional and what isn't, do you explain to people why the Constitution should be important to them? I, I do, and I always point out that libertarians in general want to dramatically reduce the size of the federal government and leave all of that money in the hands of ordinary Americans. And I ask them, I say, Are you, is there anybody here who is upset that I'm going to let you keep all of your money? And, you know, everybody laughs because that's something that uh, everyone really wants. Uh, talking to college students, I ask them why they are moving away from mom and, you know, from home when mom and dad love them. I said, why would you move into a small studio apartment and, and live just above the poverty level? And the answer is, for liberty. They want to make their own decisions. And I commend them on that. I tell them that that's an excellent thing for them to be doing. And then I ask, why would you allow, if you don't allow mom and dad to make decisions for you, why would you allow the government to make decisions for you? Does the government love you more than mom and dad? And the answer, of course, is ludicrous. Uh, libertarians believe that in any decision about your life, either you can make that decision or the government can make that decision for you. And libertarians are overwhelmingly in favor of people making their own decisions in life. Well, that's good. You have to get their attention first, and the way to get their attention is to talk about how much better their lives could be if we could only change things, and then they are willing to listen to the Constitution, rights, or any of these other things. Uh, Mark in Bozeman, Montana, says, I have never been so enthusiastic about a presidential candidate. Michael, I have your name stickered and postered all over my vehicle here in southwest Montana. Question, do you see access to the corporate party's debates, meaning last night, as the seminal event in getting recognized as a popular alternative to the Democrats and Republicans? Or is there something else you see happening that will thrust us libertarians to parity with the others? Uh, did you uh, follow that? I, I did understand the question, and it, certainly if I was allowed to participate in the debate, I would win the debate without without question. Uh, the question, you know, obviously, the Democrats and Republicans don't want me in the debate because I would change the course of American politics. Uh, we would be able to shatter the death grip that the Democrats and Republicans currently have on the uh, the politics in Washington. So while yes, the, the debates would be a seminal change, I'm not holding my breath and waiting for that. Uh, we are using the internet. Uh, my website has a blog that has been very very popular, and we are. Uh, Lighting the fires of liberty, getting that grassroots movement, and local libertarians at the county and state levels have been very, very helpful this year in my uh, campaign, doing you know, whatever is best in their region. Uh, libertarians are always promoting the free market, and my campaign has been an example of that, where libertarians have just gone off and done whatever they want. They've created um, bumper stickers. Um, shortly after the campaign, I saw coffee cups and T-shirts with my photographs on them, and, and people are just going off and doing whatever they can think of and spreading the word, which is really wonderful. So I don't know where the uh, that final straw is going to come. Uh, I think that libertarians should try everything they can to keep up the good work. Um, I think that very, very soon we will become the uh, overnight success that we deserve to be, but where and when that's going to happen, I'm really not smart enough to say. And Michael, you have generated a lot of uh, phone calls and emails tonight. I guess we have one or two libertarians listening to the show, among all those all those statists who love me. Um, let's go now to Oregon and talk with James. James, good evening. Good evening, Harry. Yes. Pleasure what, to be here. Um, pleasure so many, to have you. So many questions, so little time. I'll try and be brief. Um, first of all, um, there was an earlier caller who called in and compared the uh, presidential debates to Gilligan's Island. I think that's <laughs> flat out insulting to Gilligan's Island, to tell you the truth. Um, so anyway, uh, first first real question. Um, Mr. Bednarik, do uh, you support... Uh, real enforcement of the Constitution? In other words, do you support jail t time for politicians that actually 
uh, pass laws or are complicit in passing laws that are unconstitutional? But actually, I do, and uh, I've dwelt on that issue. We have allowed the Congress to get so out of hand. Um, I, I think that my personal thing would be to uh, announce that we will be enforcing it and to uh, incarcerate anybody who violates it in the future. Not uh, do it retroactively. And the ad, not to do it retroactively. We, the people, are ultimately responsible. We, we the people, are the ones who continue to uh, elect these politicians in spite of the fact that they pass laws like the Patriot Act. So uh, I, I think that we, the people, have, you know, uh, to have to bear some of that responsibility as well. So as, as I become president, I will uh, let them know that there is a new sheriff in town, that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and that any future transgressions will be met with an indictment. Uh, yeah, there's all, let's see, there's already, um, you can already take someone to a uh, treasonous, uh, you can uh, pursue the, the treason angle, but, but no one gets the treason that, that treatment. Um, so well, I don't think treason is defined as just simply violating the Constitution. It would be it's one of them. endangering the United States of America through uh, collaborating with the foreign policy. Yes. yes. Um, but I'm talking about laws you know, or, um, other than that. I mean, real jail time, because treason, no one, no one gets hit with treason anymore. Oh, I see what you're saying, sure. Um, Anyway, right. you've already answered the question. Uh, may I ask another? Or do you yeah, go ahead, uh, but make it brief because we are just coming sure. to the end now. Um, this is uh, going to hit you like a ton of bricks, but can you acknowledge, Mr. Bittner, can you acknowledge the possibility that the entire war on terror is a multi-billion dollar Pentagon-run protection racket? Um, I don't have any evidence to that effect. I do believe that our foreign policy has a tendency to increase the threat of uh, attack rather than reduce it, but uh, I would never... Uh, I mean, again, I don't have the evidence that the Pentagon is uh, deliberately fomenting this type of uh, attack. Um, what about the 911 um, conspiracy theories, for lack of a better phrase? Um, I've been campaigning for two years. I really don't have time to read my email. So I, I'm aware that these videos exist. I've had uh, several people along the campaign trail give me DVDs. Uh, and that's one of the, the benefits, I guess, or disadvantages of running. People constantly give me things. I have people who give me books. But we are traveling with a suitcase and... Uh, I usually have to just ship those things back to the office. So I have a huge, a huge pile of stuff that I haven't had a chance to uh, read or view yet. Well, thank you very, very much. Okay, thank you for the call. Uh, quickly, in the little time we have left now, uh, can you give me a brief rundown on your new book? This is a question from Rick. Uh, the, your book is it called "It's Good to Be King." That's correct. Uh, is, I, it, is this already out? First of all, it is due to be out momentarily, uh, probably next week. Literally, okay. that, we got, what, Michael, we only have one minute, so give me the one minute review. It is a uh, discussion of why we have any government at all and why the founding fathers chose a constitutional republic. It's available at Amazon.com and uh, basically contains all the information that I teach in my eight-hour class on constitutional fundamentals. Oh, well, you have 25 more seconds now. <laughs> uh, I want to encourage people to visit the LP website, lp.org. They can also call my campaign office at 800-807-7552. That's 800 807 Seven five five two. We'd be happy to send you yard signs or bumper stickers. Okay, I'll put that uh, phone number on the uh, my website, also on the links page, along with badneric dot org. B a d n a r i k dot org. Michael, uh, thank you very very much. I know how difficult campaigning is, and you've taken an hour, almost an hour and a half of of your time on a night when you could have gotten some sleep to uh, be with us. And I know it's appreciated because we've gotten so many phone calls and so many emails. And I want to wish you the best of luck for the rest of the campaign. It doesn't matter how many votes you get, but it does matter how many people become aware that they don't have to live this way, that there are alternatives, and we thank you for what you're doing to bring that about. Uh, thank you so much. Welcome back. I picked that theme music for this start of the last segment, the music by Johann Sebastian Bach, uh, Jesus, Joy of Man's Desiring, because of its happy flavor, and I want to remind you that after two hours, and when we too often get in the habit here of talking about what's going wrong in America and what the problems are, that there is a life to be lived in the meantime, and you only have one of them. You don't get a second chance. And if you don't enjoy this life, if you don't do what is necessary, given the conditions as they exist, to find a way to enjoy your life, then it's your fault. It's your problem, and you're not going to get another chance to repair it. So that's why I always end the show by saying do something nice for yourself and your family this week, because that's the first obligation you have. I hope you do everything possible to promote libertarian ideas and to help turn things around in this country. But I don't want you to do it at the neglect of your own life and your own family, because that's the first thing you've got to worry about. My apologies to all the people who sent in emails that we didn't get to. We did get more emails, far more than usual tonight, and I just had to take the few that I could because we also had a lot of phone calls. I have on the Radio Links page the phone number for the Bad Mara campaign. That's 1-800-807-7552, and also the website link and so forth. There's also 
a link to the article that I mentioned earlier about the Army Sergeant who wrote an article criticizing the war in Iraq and is now being prosecuted. There also there is a link to factcheck.org, which has corrected a lot of the statements made by Kerry and Bush last night. And lastly, there's an article that I did get a chance to didn't get a chance to discuss, an article from the Portland Oregonian about a staff sergeant in Iraq who, after things were turned over supposedly to the Iraqis, the Iraqi security forces, uh, the staff sergeant witnessed the Iraqi security forces beating up prisoners. And he called for help to an American unit who came in and stopped them. But then the American unit was ordered to turn the prisoners back over to the same guards who had been beating them up. And so this is what happens with our freedom-fighting friends who have just been newly liberated in Iraq. In any event, this is it for tonight. I hope you'll come back next week. And as I said, do something nice for yourself and your family. This is Harry Brown. Thanks for listening.